Okay, hello everyone. Let's go ahead and take a look at chapter 12, which is called Periodic Phenomena. We've basically started, well, started off by taking a look at the unit circle and radians, and how that relates to trigon trigonometry. Now we're going to actually look at trigonometry from a functional perspective, and we're going to describe the functional characteristics of all the trig graphs as exhibiting what is called period of periodic characteristic or periodic nature. So let's just go ahead and first get an idea of what we're referring to when we talk about periodic and periodic phenomena. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this here. I got a basic table of values which start off at 1, goes to 8, and it continues. And notice that the y values are 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, dot, dot, dot. Now, what I've done as well is I've gone ahead and put all of those values onto a graph. So this is what the graph is looking like. So notice I plot 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1, 5, 3, 6, etc., etc. So now one of the things that you should be able to recognize is that obviously here, when you take a look at the table, these are all just going by increments of 1. These over here are all repeating. Okay? And so when you take a look at the graph, you should be able to see that repetition as well. So it goes 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4. And so what we have now is we have a very visual pattern uh, on the graph or also represented by the table. Now, what we want to do then is we want to actually go ahead and try to put some functional notation to this pattern. And notice that the range values repeat predictably over and over. So 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, and then of course I could continue here. And you can see how that looks if we go about looking at the graph this way as well. Now if that's the case, what we say is that the function is periodic. Okay, now let's continue with that because we still need to go ahead and describe a little bit more about what that means. Now, if I go ahead and just take a look and use my, if I use my functional notation, I know for a fact that f of 1 is going to be equal to 1, because f of 1 is equal to 1, but I also know that f of 4 is equal to 1, and I also know that f of 7 is equal to 1. So notice that all of these values over here, and if I continue, all of them would be equal to 1. It's the same thing with the 3s, and it's the same thing with the 4s. All of these values over here would all be the same. So what does that mean then? If I go ahead, because this is uh, a predictable pattern, I can now go ahead and put some mathematical language to it and some mathematical notation to it and say that if I just go ahead and concentrate on f of 1, f of 4 is really the same thing as f of 1 plus 3. f of 7 is really the same thing as f of 1 plus 2 times 3. In the same respect, I could do the same thing for f of 2 and f of 3 respectively, and you can see the examples there. And notice that this could continue on forever. So there we go. Now we have a basic idea of what's happening with regards to the functional notation of any function that is called periodic. And we can say then that f of x is going to be equal to some f of x plus p. Uh, not really knowing exactly right now what p actually refers to, but we're getting an idea that if we actually start off with this value over here, if we add something to it, and something consistently to it, so that we have this pattern here, so that we can represent this pattern here, we should have equality between these two range values. So, in general then, what we can say is that if f of x is periodic, Okay, we know that the range values repeat predictably over and over and over again okay, with a period P. So, you see this P part right over here, this is actually referring to a period. This is exactly how much it takes in order for your functional values to start to repeat. So, in other words, if I start from here, this is how long it takes for it to repeat. So, in other words, there's three units in between, and that's why I come up with a three value. Now, I could also go ahead and talk about 6, because if I go here and I jump all the way to here, it's also going to be a 6. But generally speaking, what we do is we take the smallest value of p that's possible. So in this case over here, we would refer to it as 3. So what that means then is that, in general, if f of x is periodic with the period p, then we can always go ahead and say that the functional values are going to be the same if we go ahead and add that period, that period value to x and evaluate the function at that point. And so what we can do now, 
based upon our table, based upon our graph, based upon how we want to go ahead and take a look at how to represent that pattern using functional notation, we can now go ahead and describe a periodic function with a period p at this way, mathematically. Okay, so there are a couple of questions that I want you to go ahead and think about as well. It is, what periodic phenomenon do you know of? Because there are obviously a lot of different phenomena out there that repeat over a particular cycle and it repeats over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? What kind of periodic phenomenon are you familiar with? Also, we also want to be particular about looking at two trigonometric functions that we already are familiar with, and that's going to be the sine x and the cosine x. Now, we talked about this as a parent function, and you also have that on one of your handouts. So I want you to go ahead and take a look at those graphs. We'll go ahead and also see, using a demonstration, exactly how those graphs are generated based upon the unit circle. But I think it's going to be important for you to also go ahead and consider what is essential to graph these parent functions and graph them very quickly. Okay? They are predictable, so we should be able to do that. And knowing that you also have all the parameters to make transformations, we can now go ahead and look for all the children as well. So, there you go. You have the introduction to what periodic phenomenon is, uh, what that represents, and how you can actually represent that using mathematical functional notation. Okay? So we'll talk about this a little bit more in class and see if anybody has any questions. Until then, see you later. Bye-bye.